Great. So welcome to the Russian History Seminar of Washington, D.C. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say that you should have received a save the date message from our trusty administrator, Chris Sealing, um, so that after this, we have um, a scaled down, I think, uh, program, but a good one. And in the end of March, we have Sarah Brinegar um, talking about Baku oil. Sarah, what date is, do you remember the exact date? Is it March 20th? March 23rd. 23rd, March 23rd. And then we have in early May, um, Alexis Perry uh, talking about her new project, um, a post-World War II project. Okay, so the, the game plan is this. I'll turn it over to Stas. He'll give a, a, a little introduction to his paper. Um, and then Greg is gonna give a commentary and then we'll open it up to the usual discussion. And I'll, if, if you want me to, to moderate, I can do that. It's up to you really. So Stas, it's all yours. Thank you for interesting paper. Uh, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. I uh, hope we'll have some interesting discussion here. Um, the piece that you read or not, it's a shortened version of my chapter on patriotism, which is a part of the, my dissertation that called uh, Noble Feelings of Dissent, Russian Emotional Culture and the Decembrist Revolt. Um, my dissertation revolves uh, around the noble culture. Uh, it's a big part of it. And then I try to connect it to, to Decembrist conspiracy enterprises. Um, Interestingly, my whole dissertation started from the topic of patriotism, and it's my flagman chapter. Um, first, I saw it in uh, December's memoirs, etc. But then I started to connect it to the fathers, and then I've discovered there was virtual public discussion on patriotism in late 18th century, especially early 19th century in Russia. And I found a lot of uh, booklets on this topic um, in the archives, a lot of um, articles in the journals. So it was like kind of a question for me too. I mean, how, how was it that important during this year? Um, it seems that sometimes that patriotism is kind of known topic, especially in December studies. Many scholars noted that um, patriotism obviously was one of the major ideas and motives of Decembrism, but no one ever really wrote about it kind of in depth or tried to describe what patriotism basically meant. Um, I also not familiar with any um, real serious work on Russian patriotism in general, except there is right now a new book by uh, Michael Kron from St. Petersburg, which is called Patriotism, but it's just got out, so I couldn't read it yet. Um, but in general, we don't have studied that really deal with patriotism in this sense. And obviously, especially not just as an idea, but also as an emotion. As an emotion, I'm familiar only with two works on patriotism, one of Nicolio Stas from NYU on American patriotism in 1812 war. And, um, an article on Russian patriotism of Catherine the Great by Ingrid Shirley. I also took uh, from this draft, um, I guess, maybe more boring, maybe not, uh, sections of, um, of kind of what sociology and political science think uh, on patriotism. Um, but in general, and interestingly, sociologists actually define patriotism as a cognitive motivational response reflected in beliefs and emotions and treated more like affection and sense of belonging between group members. That is to say, patriotism already kind of defined in the broader scholarly community is more like emotion than just an idea or a concept. And also sociologists tend to differentiate between two kinds of patriotism, the blind one and constructive one, meaning the blind when it's blind loyalty to the state, to the ruler, and the constructive when people have something to say about it that not necessarily aligns with the official line. Uh, I also don't touch here on the topic of nationalism for many reasons. Um, and it's unfortunately because some scholars 
use nationalism and patriotism in their works interchangeably, especially while dealing with the assemblies. Um, and it's not that the assemblies didn't have any nationalistic kind of thought, but it was just the beginning. And one of the reasons for this kind of confusion between patriotism and nationalism, especially during this period, is exactly because of confusion of, of the aims of patriotism. And the aims of nationalism in modern sense, it's nation state. And early 19th century, just the beginning of an idea of nation state. Decembrists and rationalists didn't see it as nation state per se during this period. So it's this concept is actually even archaic and anachronistic to the Decembrist period. It just starts uh, the nationalism as we know nowadays and 1848 just to appear during this period. Um, I guess my major argument here, or I guess major outtake in this chapter, that there was something that I described as double shift in names of patriotism. Um, something that was kind of mentioned by many scholars, especially Russian ones, but never kind of brought into one whole. Um, uh, and actually, I'm trying to tie up here some loose ends and very diverse opinions because people attribute different shifts of patriotic aim to different per time periods. Um, and basically, what I'm saying that there was shift from patriotic attention um, from from the from the from the ruler to the state fatherland in the late 18th century, the turn of the 19th century or at least the alternative of patriotic service appeared during this period. And then uh, right about around the Napoleonic Wars and especially after Napoleonic Wars, the nation comes with a major actor in the minds of many Russians and, and as we know of many Europeans per se. In general, scholars say that modern patriotism, especially with regard to nation was born during patriotic wars. So, and then the attention also splits, not just from the ruler to the state, but also from the state to kind of to nation, meaning a state which usually called fatherland during the late 18th century gets more kind of clear face. It becomes people, it becomes nation, but in cultural sense, not in a modern political sense of nationalism. Uh, and then, yeah, that's why I also find very, um, very useful this triple distinction that uh, Harf Kordin does, uh, who actually presented now Russian seminar, but I, I unfortunately didn't attend. But what he said that there was kind of triple distinction in the early 19th century between the ruler, the state, and what he calls society, but society in the mean of country or nation to this sense. So yeah, I guess it will, it will be enough for, to start a discussion, thank you. Um, great, thank you Stas for a fascinating paper. And um, I wanna flag a few things. Um, and in particular, Stas's careful attention to the literary works and the use of concepts in literary works. So this is not just a history of emotions, it's also kind of the Griffsgeschichte of um, patriotism, and as well as its various cognate terms like fatherland, motherland, um, homeland, etc. Um, and I think the the very precise nature of the way that um, a chizna and a techistva become uh, distinct and the way that the, the reference to a techistva becomes suspect after 1789 as a sort of potential seed of republicanism, I think is a very interesting element of this paper. And I, I think it's something that we should discuss more, especially because that's what um, the Decemberists are reacting to is, is a kind of like, um, is the, the attempt to reintegrate uh, the love of the fatherland and the love of the Tsar together in this sort of reactionary gesture. Um, and so I wanted to ask three questions um, and you know, you're, um, you're not, you don't have to answer all of them, of course, and um, just take uh, whatever uh, of this that you find useful. But um, the first question is, so um, there's a scholar, Leah Greenfield, who has a book on nationalism. And uh, there she defines Russian nationalism as this sort of like uh, a kind of raisonnement, right? Like this idea that 
Russian nationalism evolves uh, as a negative rejection of uh, Western, of Westernism essentially. And that starts pretty early on in, in the 18th century, but obviously evolves more fully with the Slavophiles. But, um, and Hans Roger in his book, which you cite a couple of times argues, you know, for the significance of the, the counter example of like French, uh, you know, French maîtres and various uh, uh, like tutors and so forth as like a, um, as like a counterpoint to the emerging Russian nationalism or in Russian national consciousness rather. So um, how does this negative form of patriotism work in your case? And how does it function emotionally for the Decemberists? And do they, um, do they buy into this idea of Russian nationalism as being like something that is not Western? And uh, to what extent do, do they react against that? Uh, because obviously they're heavily influenced by French ideas. Um, and then the second question I want to ask is, um, how is patriotism gendered, right? Because there's a lot of uh, talk about fathers and mothers here and, uh, you know, sons and, of the fatherland, daughters of the fatherland. Um, and so there's a lot of gendered language and patriotism, of course, is a very gendered emotion um, in the sense that it is often associated with um, uh, kind of like masculine virtues and so forth. And so, uh, so how do you, uh, I, I wanted to push you a little bit to, add, to think about the gendered aspects of it and um, and think about how in the December context, um, how this plays into this li literary culture of kind of like young male authorship. Um, and then finally, uh, the question that I wanted to ask is, how does this patriotic vision shape the actual political uh, ideas of the Decemberists, right? So, um, so you have the emotion, but um, I'm curious, for example, you know, attitudes towards the Jews in, in Pestel's work or um, there, there are other kind of representatives the representations of kind of the nation and the fatherland in their political proposals that seem to draw on this emotion um, as a source of positive, like political, of a political program. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to ask you to draw out the implications of that a little bit more, um, but I'm happy to turn over things to the discussion. Um, thanks again for a very interesting paper. Can I start answering? If you'd like. Yeah. Okay, uh, so thank you, Gregory, a lot for this uh, very important questions. They are very uh, complex indeed, especially with uh, December's nationalism. Um, yes, they did have some kind of emerging, emerging sense uh, what scholars call, for example, even the chapter Russianness. Um, and it's obviously because it's also the era when uh, the romantic um, trends, you know, of seeing history and uh, the tradition uh, emerges in Europe, right, harder and everything. Um, and they, of course, they have it. And they, they look back to the history. They look, obviously, to uh, Novgorod Republic, etc. And they don't like Poles, right? And they don't, apropos, don't like Jews. Well, Pestel, at least. Um, but even other scholars, for example, which after when she calls Russian patriotism exactly of that period as Russianness, uh, she says an uh, interesting thing indeed that for them, for the elites, for the Russian elites, it's not, it's in a sense of enlightenment. Basically, the attitude, the negative attitude to other nations is um, not unlike it comes much later. That's like there are there is no that much kind of antagonism. It's more about they are not enlightened other people. Or for example, they usually talk about Ottoman, they are barbarian. Uh, they talk about Turkey quite a lot. Uh, but it's not it's not the same sense of nationalism, and it's kind of it's there. It lurks in the back, but it never becomes really a big issue for Decembers. The first Decemberist uh, society, the Order of Russian Knights, established by Olov and Mitri of Lomonov, it was kind of very aristocratic and it was in a bit anti-German and anti-Polish. But then already next um, secret society, Union of Salvation, that started from also kind of anti-German sentiments. And when I say anti-German sentiments, it's sentiments against the German generals uh, in Russian service. It's quickly uh, becomes uh, dropped. 
because other assemblers don't like it and they don't like this kind of talk and it doesn't become real issue for disassembly patriotism per se. And then eventually they have even converted a Jew in their ranks who even established his own kind of society with Glinka, Grigory uh, Peretz um, in St. Petersburg. So it's not, it's not a focus for them in this sense. Um, and indeed scholars don't see this, uh, um, well, not always in nationalistic terms. Interesting point that the only book in German that's written about December is about December patriotism, but it's about nationalism. But this book was written in 1963. So you can feel like this kind of discourse of those years going on. And yeah, the writer present December's kind of nationalism in this sense. Um, the question of gender is very interesting, but I mean, even from the concepts, uh, we can see that we have only sons of fatherland, right? We, we don't, I never saw like daughters of fatherland, for example. It is very male patriotism in this sense. And I mean, we obviously need to, to, to deal more with this topic and question, but it depends also on the sources. Um, as far as I know, I saw a, a bit of like, let's say a female reaction to patriotism and they were a bit conservative, for example, after December surprising, but then we have uh, December's wives that followed them to Siberia. So that, yeah, I mean, it's a sensitive question, but I didn't deal with it thoroughly. Um, but this thing of Sons of Fatherland reminds me also the famous book of Lynn Hunt on French Revolution reimagined through images of family. And then what she said that what happened there, that exactly what that, that the revolutionaries, the band of brothers overthrew the father, the king, but also the mother, right? Marie Antoinette. And they actually did treat um, Patri as motherland, right? As Rodina, she's in a Russian case. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the liberty was protected as a woman, but in a sense, there was no place for women. It was a band of brothers. Sisters didn't have a role to play in French Revolution. In a sense, maybe we can see some of this kind of thing in, um, in December surprising too. Now, this is an, an interesting question. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stas. Do you want me to moderate or do you prefer to field your own questions? It's really up to you. Uh, you can moderate. Yeah, it's okay. All right. So uh, Christine has her uh, said that she wants to talk. Okay. Hi. You have to unmute, though. Thank you. I'm going to um, follow up on Greg's observation about gender. And I think there's some ways in which it can be included because the language that is that you present to us is so very gendered. And I was quite struck when you were talking about the book on the duties of man and citizen that you quoted from the book and it said that Sons of the Fatherland uh, is a name that could be given to people of both sexes. Yes. So that women could also be sons of the fatherland. But what I'd like to suggest is, is that there's something really interesting going on around patriotism in this period of time, which is there are different roles for men and for women in, do, in, in the course of being expressing their patriotism. And if you look at something like Russian court dress, I'm sorry, I, I've written about this. And what you find is, is that men are expected to look as Europeans and women are expected to represent Russianness. Mm. And I think if you, you can tease some interesting things out about this so that it, it, it actually coincides very nicely with the term Achechistva and Rudina, that it's about women's role as givers of birth, of identity, of homeland, all of that is associated with females and it's their obligation at court to represent that in the clothing that they wear. 
But in addition to that, I think that there's some interesting work that's been done on the curriculum in the women's schools that uh, are being created in this period of time, including what they're being taught, what the goals of them are. And once again, it's not exactly, you know, freedom for everybody or equality for everybody. And then finally, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there is an Imperial Women's Patriotic Society that gets started in 1812. And that is this essentially a philanthropic society, but it is, it's, you know, its title is patriotic. So I think you can find a few things like this that would help you to unpack some of this language and make, make your topic more inclusive in a sense, but also make it more interesting and more complicated. And the, the other thing that I wanted to say, and I don't really, can't say too much about this, but I've been struck by how many Russian landowners talk about serving the fatherland through their agricultural work. And I wondered the extent to which land, the land itself becomes fundamental to their sense of, of patriotism. And that would also, I think, might go along with the, you know, the um, sort of dropping Atyachistva for Achija, which again is, is about land and particularly around the Napoleonic Wars when that's literally what they're about to do is to defend the land that's theirs. And so I'm thinking of Val Kibbelson's argument for the Muscovite period maybe moved, moved forward a bit. But the person who, who I've read most, most of is uh, Andrei Bulatov who talks about um, improving agricultural yields and all of that as being a way to support the fatherland and the state. So he might be someone else who, I, I realize he's not a Decemberist, but I think he is helping to articulate some of this. So thank you for an interesting paper. Uh, thank you, Christine, very much. It's uh, this all very great comments. I mean, Claudius, it's fascinating. Actually, my future plan was maybe to write something on this because it's kind of we can see even in the memoirs how the sermons de describe how people close and it has a lot of symbolism. But it also during this period mostly about parades and uh, military um, ex exercises, but they all uh, complain, oh, not just Decembrists, all the military in Russia since Paul the first. Um, but that's interesting what you're saying. I didn't know that women had to close more Russian clothes. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting because it's, yeah, it's very, it's counterbalanced because I actually read a couple of days ago that Russian military was also, like there was a fight for Russian military also in uniform. And uh, obviously Paul already started to make it Russians to wear up Russian kind of uh, mundir, et cetera. So it's, became more and more westernized also with Alexander the first and it was extremely important to officers. It's very interesting connection on this. And it's it's always about incorporating what they call Russian folk design into European fashion. Yeah. And that, that's why it's it gets really interesting and complicated and good for historians to sort of think about. <laughs> no, it's fascinating topic. Yeah. I mean this tension in the clothes it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, and um, about agriculture, uh, yeah, I mean, it's also connected to the topic of service, because when we talk about uh, patriotism during this period, it's about basically what is an expression of patriotism, it's service, and service can take different shapes, and uh, the recent authors on European nobility, Andrei Zorin and Sean Neff, for example, there are two books, one of them of articles, but it's all about kind of nobility and service. And they say, yes, noble could serve in different ways. And for many of them, it was to develop the personal estate and to be good to the peasants, et cetera, exactly what Volotov did. So, and yeah, I'm trying to touch on provincial patriotism too, but it's a bit different, but it's interesting connection. Thank you. So, uh, um... Let me just, in the spirit of continuing the conversation, 
just flag a couple of the points that were already made. Um, first of all, and Joseph, I, um, Brad, I did see your hand, so you're next. Um, um, but now Stas moved on my screen. Oh, there he is. <laughs> um, first of all, as Greg pointed out, you do have a lot of talk of mothers and fathers. So the reader's expectation is that you will delve more deeply into this issue. And I think that's where this is all coming from. And in particular to me, you know, your point about Rodina uh, being a translation of Patrie, I think could be investigated further because there's a very large literature on Patrie in the French historiography. Um, and in particular, Daniel Bell, and if I remember Sophie Rosenfeld's first book, my Adna Kursnitsa, Sophie, and, um, and others who are tracing this concept. And of course, you know, the, the point that Greg is making about the sort of anti-French, uh, anti-Republican sentiment here. So the gender piece, you know, is present in your paper, but it's not really pursued. And also one wonders about the personification of Rodina always being a female. I want in later periods, it always was, but I wonder if visually it was. I also wonder, you know, whether um, Atyachistra, of course, is a much earlier word, but whether it has any connection to Vaterland, given how Eurocentric the elites were in this period. So those are questions um, relating to the sort of gender piece, how it fits in with your history of concepts and the way you deal with political thought through the history of emotions. Because to me, that was a real interesting feature. I think Greg made the same point of your paper that you're, it reminded me of almost like Richard Wartman, how he dealt with, he's dealing with a ceremonial and visual culture and cultural representations of connected to monarchy. But through that lens, he's able to get through all these kind of core political issues. And you're kind of doing the same thing through the history of emotions, which I find quite interesting. And uh, Greg raised Leah Greenfeld's point, you know, famous thesis about ressentiment. And of course that relates to the early 19th century kind of reaction to uh, Russia always being imitators and inferior. That was already underway in the early 19th century. And then it leads into the Slavophiles. But I think what you're portraying here is a potentially a different tradition, a sort of proto-Westernizer tradition, where they're, if I'm hearing you correctly, they're not feeling themselves inferior. They want citizenship and love for a secularized um, uh, um, a homeland to be kind of um, at the centerpiece and to, to, to get that away from absolutism. So in a way, the, the, the point that Greg was making is that maybe if I could take it one step further, maybe it, it's, it's a different tradition you're, you're dealing with. Now there's a bunch of hands. I don't know if you want to respond or take maybe take a few more. It's up to you. No, I prefer to respond one by one. Um, yes, I mean, uh, yes, I agree that there, there's a lot uh, what to, to be said about this. And it is indeed very interesting, this Rodina and Chisna, but I, I just didn't see anyone dealing with that from all the scholar that they cite. So I just myself, it, just dawned on me that in Russian it's uh, feminine, but in English it's not necessarily. Every time I write uh, kind, um, kind of love for the fatherland uh, in a translator, it gives me um, fatherland, never motherland, but sometimes uh, state, which is a different um, concept. But it's interesting indeed in Russian because it's feminine. And Catherine the Great did not want, as far as I know, to be called mother or fatherland. This by itself kind of a play of words. Uh, but as we know, she, she yeah, and it's, it's ambiguous what she was doing in the sense of uh, gender roles, because she was trying to be an emperor, but she was a woman, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I agree, I, uh, we need to flesh this uh, aspect much more. Um, 
that didn't come much through my sources yet, but I think in this, through history of concept, maybe we can see different indeed attitudes. And as scholars say, indeed, in early 19th century, especially after the Napoleonic World, all this achievement and Rodina, this kind of attitude becomes different also a bit. So there's a lot what to, to discover there, I think. Yeah, thank you. Hey, uh, Brad, you're next. Um, so Stas, thanks for, very much for a very stimulating um, paper. I got a lot out of it. And I've got three um, questions or three comments, and I'll try to tie them together. The first one is a kind of an extension of, of what Greg and Misha already started to talk about. Um, love of fatherland clearly appears a lot in your paper, understandably. And sometimes it can seem a little bit devoid of content. Um, clearly, one is not to love just any fatherland, or, or, may, or maybe yes, in the case of, of, of the Russian Decembrists, that you love Russia the way it is. You know, this is the Russian Norod, this is the Russian monarch, you know, love it or leave it. But clearly there's some, there's an idea of a certain kind of fatherland, maybe an aspirational fatherland that one, that one should love. I think you do address this, but it seems like it's sometimes kind of scattered and, and maybe if you, if you could kind of focus, focus in, one, in one place. Um, my second question is, has to do with, uh, I guess, Russian distinctiveness. Clearly this generation participates in a transnational uh, Republic of Letters, right? Nuchone Respublica, O Brutus, O Washington, right? Oh, Silver Spring, oh, Bethesda. I mean, the, the, it's clearly, they, they feel like they're part, part of something bigger. But I wonder what do they think about the Russian, uh, the, the, the idea of love of fatherland in Russia in particular? Um, and of course, this brings up the question of, of autocracy. What do they do with, uh, autocracy when they want to love the fatherland. I think you do address this also um, and make several astute points. One I liked in particular, you say something about the patriotism from above versus patriotism from below. But again, maybe if you could kind of concentrate a little or focus it a little bit more, you show the repressive side of autocracy, not, not hard to do, right? At the beginning and the end, the trial, but monarchy was also regarded as a civilizing force. So if you're a good Decembrist, what, what do you do then? Do you, do you uh, work with the monarchy to improve the fatherland or do you uh, go, go it alone, so to speak? And that leads me to my third um, thought or third question. Um, and of course, one did not have to go it alone in those days in Russia. And your, your work reminded me of stuff I read a long time ago when I was uh, working on civil society and voluntary associations. Uh, these, these men did associate. And you do uh, write about that very briefly, um, um, associations. Um, and of course, this is a kind of budding um, civil society, the, or at least the idea, the idea of civic virtue and interdependence and mutuality and love of one's fellow men and all that sort of thing. But there is one particular kind of association I thought I might see and, and I missed it. Maybe you, maybe you deal with it elsewhere. And that's the Freemasons. Um, because Freemasonry here you also have uh, ideas of civic virtue, of uh, the urge to be good, to, to improve, friendship, patriot, patriotic service, and so on. Now, in Anglo-American Freemasonry, there's a tension between living for others, doing good for others, and individual improvement, oneself. And so I'll wind up with this. I don't know, in the Russian case, do you see individuality uh, and individual, uh, the individual, uh, does this emerge as, as an object or is it only about the collective? And I'll, and I'll stop there. 
Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is very <laughs> deep and thoughtful comments. About the first one, do you mean what? how do they see the fatherland kind of uh, imagined fatherland? Well, I think this, I suppose this is a, uh, the political dimension and, and maybe understandably you're, you're, you're uh, it's a well-trod path and, and you wanna bring up many other, other dimensions of it, but what is the fatherland that one should love? What, what does that look like politically? Is it a republic? Is it a, is it a limited monarchy? Is it a, a sort of cultivation of small city states as in sort of early modern and Renaissance civic virtue or humanism and so on. I mean, what, what exactly is the fatherland that one should love? Is it the Russia we've got or a, or a different one? I see, yes. And this uh, comment exactly gets together with your second about how to work with autocracy. Now I see. Uh, so uh, yes, I am, like this short term purpose doesn't just touch on these political issues. I actually deal with this in the next chapter, which is on on or more. And um, yes, for most of the lib even liberal elites during this period, including mo a majority of December's constitutional monarchy, for example, was still the best or kind of the most optimal um, rule. So they did want to work uh, with autocracy this way or another. I actually read accidentally today uh, that, that interesting thing that one scholar says even that they wanted the republic, it didn't, um, but they wanted like this president like in your United States, but so this president wasn't in their minds different than from constitutional monarch. They actually wanted the same, even if there were like political tensions between the members who wants monarchy or who wants uh, republics. Um, but yes, I mean, the, especially first in December society, they all were about working together with the government. This is a good question that modern scholars raise where they secret at all, because uh, like conspiratorial organization, I'm talking about union of salvation and union of welfare, because they were kind of pretty open and they actually wanted at some point to ask official recognition from the monarch. And they wanted to work together with autocracy, exactly as you say, in enlightenment and civilizing the nation and bringing prosperity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the attitude uh, to the monarch changes, and that's what I talk about within different chapters. Um, it changes drastically because, and Wortman kind of wrote about this, that the scenario of Alexander I is a scenario of friendship. And nobility during this period see the monarch as a superior, but in a sense superior among the equals they want to work with him together and he doesn't let them and they get disappointed, et cetera, it's another story. But there is also that. Um, and um, going to civil society in Freemasons, I write about this in my uh, first chapter more and in chapter on secret societies. So there I also, <laughs> I cite your book too about these free associations because uh, it's exactly that, that Russian masonry kind of paved the way to this uh, attitude um, to seeing the civil, um, for the emerging, as you say, civil society, right? Um, and it's paved the way to kind of secret organization too. And the first secret organizations, these two unions were built on uh, Mason rituals, were built on all December's when Masonic lodges. And uh, this, what you, when you talk about this inside the masonry uh, difference between individual and, um, and collective and public work, it kind of um, coincides in Russia in the sense of morality, why? Because working the rough stone, to take the Douglas uh, phrase of Russian masonry means uh, to work yourself, to work on your own, uh, to self-improvement of moral emotions but that's how you start uh, political uh, kind of programs. For them, uh, enlightenment starts from self-enlightenment in a sense, right? So, and it's interesting because for example, Union of Welfare, uh, they, uh, they adopted new members only if they were moral enough. 
and one of the official uh, statues of Union of Affair was leading moral life and um, kind of self-improving yourself all the time and then kind of to enlighten others around you. So there was this initial thrust until 1820s. That's why we cannot talk about decentralism as one conspiracy and modern scholars say, no, it's like very diverse, there are different phases of kind of radicalization also. Um, Thank yeah. you. So, so the, uh, I have a list here of Steve, Misha, and Catherine. Uh, thanks a lot for this uh, paper, really interesting. Um, I'm a little trepidatious, I think, actually asking my question in part because I, I read this pretty quickly and, and I haven't read about a lot of this kind of stuff in a very long time. Um, but it really, really is thought provoking and interesting. And, and you know, I'm always a little um, worried about you know, asking you to make something deeper, even, you know, given the amount of depth that's here, but, but Christine, when she brought up, you know, talking more about gender, makes me also think like, I wanted to know a little bit more about sort of family and, and the relationship or the role of family here, sort of the way that, that these folks thought about family. Um, and at times, you know, I guess I was just interested in sort of what exactly you mean when you talk about emotion. Um, so, for example, in on page eight, you, you talk about the personalized metaphors of Tietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietzatietz
And they also, you can see it in my source, and they always also describe it as like flaming and hot. And that's how they saw it. So in a sense, I think it's important for us also to try to see it that way. And also I feel it helps to deal with these sort of ideas in a better way because I didn't, I wouldn't write about patriotism otherwise I feel like I came there from emotions and I, I came to this kind of uh, making these distinctions between this kind of shifts based on objects of, of affection, right? So it's, but I would never get to this other way because they are objects of affection. It's not like just thinking they talk about love or to, to, to the ruler or to the state or to the nation, but it's something to serve, to have kind of connection to. I mean, so actually, you know, because your question is great and I usually ask this question, but in case of patriotism, I think it's a little bit easier for me actually, because I think it's, we can see that it's emotional for the contemporaries for the beginning, so yeah, well, thank you. Isha, I think you're next. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. Uh, I, uh, Stas, I read your paper with great and keen interest and uh, I learned a lot from it and you did an excellent job of unearthing uh, quite a few new texts, quite pithy and meaningful and uh, actually untapped or completely forgotten. And I think this aspect of your research is especially important and uh, inspiring for others. And uh, for me personally, I, it, it was a revelation to read about, uh, to read quotations, long quotations in your analysis of uh, articles published in uh, semi-forgotten or less semi-forgotten, still uh, rarely used uh, journals and uh, or pamphlets or uh, tracts uh, of late 18th century. So, so your foray into <clears throat> the era of enlightenment into the late 18th century is, I think, particularly particularly commendable uh, and uh, important for your uh, further analysis of the Decembrists themselves. Uh, uh, I, I'll ask a particular question a bit later about one of your quotations from uh, Druk Yunishestva. You are not very well known. Uh, Fyodor Grinka, Druk Yunishestva, not very well known piece of writing by Fyodor Grinka. But my uh, larger, somewhat larger uh, comments uh, uh, are related first to Decembrist uh, and uh, second, uh, secondly to patriotism itself, as to the Decembrist. I know how you are uh, for years, yeah, uh, enamored, kind, kind of in, in, in love with Decembrists, yeah, and that's your, that's uh, in a sense, that's a labor of love, uh, so far as I see. Uh, and uh, still, I, I, I venture to ask this question Do you really see the Decembrists as, a, as an identifiable group, yeah? that I have an impression that uh, most recent literature, uh, literature that came out after a kind of revival of interest in Decembrist, I wouldn't say lost in view, not, not at all, but you, you know, you are aware of your by Kijanska on Pestelu, by Natalia Potapova, a recent uh, set, uh, set, set of recent publications, but they questioned actually the monolithic nature of Decembrist movement and the very term of Decembrist as applied to, to an array, to array of people, to a plethora of people, are uh, very different and very different and uh, uh, maybe identifiable now as a group uh, due to the kind of contingency kind of constellation of factors. Uh, had it not been for that constellation, it would uh, they would never be in Decembrists, yeah, but uh, your analysis um, stretches back this term, not only to the early 19th century, but through the use of kind of paradoxical to me term, Decembrist fathers. So this unification goes as back as the latter half of the 18th century. Can one think about Bolsheviks' father, fathers, for example? 
or uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I mean that this is uh, I, I see kind of teleology going back as going as back as the late 18th century because even I think even as of 1812 or 18 sorry 1820 1820 uh, <laughs> the group that we can by privilege of hindsight identify the embers never existed it was just a constant a, a, I know, a, a loosely organized, a loosely connected groups of people. That's uh, about the uh, Decembrist and, but your, uh, you, uh, the way you apply history of emotion to make more sense of this movement tends to overgeneralize, I think. I think the history of emotion is invented as such to add flavor and nuance uh, to our understanding of uh, human spiritual world, but not to, <laughs> <laughs> to um, churn out new levels like class or identity or ethnicity, but okay, I think that you you tend to ascribe um, some generic qualities, emotional generic qualities, to very different people, and and just that's okay. That's not not a kind of it's, it's, please take it as more of a question rather than criticism. Uh, I'm just I'm interested in really in this question whether you indeed uh, re regard December as a more or less monolithic um, unity about the conservatives about uh, patriotism. Uh, in this case, I think that you uh, you, you okay your revelations and analysis are are indeed indeed very insightful. Uh, my question is about a kind of contrasting foil you are using to attenuate uh, December's patriotism. Uh, in several uh, instances, uh, like for example, page 44 or earlier on page 26, you uh, point to a loyalty to the monarch and to abstract state as a kind of, in terms of evolution, as a kind of inferior form of patriotism. Uh, the very choice of epithets you use uh, is indicative. For example, on page 44, uh, you write about, oh no, that's, uh, yeah, 44. Uh, conservative elites uh, had a passive and unconditional loyalty to the autocrat. For page 26, uh, conti uh, they continued link, uh, to link love of the fatherland to love of the czar and the abstract state. I doubt this evolutionary kind of evolutionary ladder with loyalty to the monarch as a kind of passive and primitive prehist kind of uh, form of patriotism and uh, uh, love for fatherland and for mm, or for my or achievement uh, Rodina as a kind of superior form uh, to supplant fully the previous form. Uh, in this sense, your uh, uh, Paper, I would say, ends uh, at exactly where it begins to be particularly interesting as it concerns uh, conservative elites. Because Nicholas the First, for example, was of the same generation, and shortly after the December surprise, December surprising here they are December indisputably. So he was very quick to integrate the rhetoric and the sentiment of uh, Rodina into distinctly and uh, purely monarchical discourse. And he instructed his son, future Alexander II, as would Alexander II do to his own children, to his own sons, Lubit Matushku Rasiu. That's exactly the gendered uh, feminine image, feminine notion of feminine trope of Rodina, completely incorporated into uh, the notions of loyalty to the monarchy, to the person of the monarch, to the dynasty as a whole. That's, uh, this is just, I think that uh, the uh, forms of patriotism you, this, you, you single out uh, could further coexist and uh, cohabitate. Yeah, that's a monarchical loyalty, patriotic loyalty, merging or blending, bl being blended with, uh, with, yeah, with new, newly established notions of Rodin and Nicholas I 
had no difficult time uh, renovating the rhetoric and more than rhetoric representation of monarchy along these lines. Again, that, that's not a discovery that and Wortman uh, has written on uh, this extensively. My uh, particular uh, point about, uh, uh, and by the way, uh, by the way of talking about Wortman, I don't think that your uh, footnote about his legal consciousness book uh, published as early as 1976, uh, that's uh, page 26, note 54. You write that mm, so much on conservative writers, statesmen, military commanders is to be found in Wortman legal consciousness, but uh, under Alexander the First. But uh, Wortman wrote about, uh, first of all, various bureaucrats, both conservative and liberal, who promoted uh, legal, uh, sense of leg sense of okay le legal administration and. Uh, in case of Alexander the first reign, uh, so he writes about, for example, he writes about uh, Gabriel Dirjavin, uh, Ivan Dmitriev, uh, for a later time, um, Dmitry Nikolaevich Gludov, Viktor Nikitich Panin. Uh, that's not about conservative only. They, Gludov was a pretty, uh, who had a hand, by the way, yeah, as, a, as a secretary of the investigation committee in the way the Decemberist uh, case was presented to the to Nicholas the uh, first, uh, that's not about conservatism. That's about uh, new sense of legalism and uh, legal administration. Yeah, and question about Senatus. I, I see that I'm, I'm okay. it's, a, it's a lengthy co uh, uh, comment. I. Uh, your quotation from Fyodor Glink and Sinatich, so that dialogue about what, what does it mean being, what, what, what being Russian means, yeah. Uh, it reminds me of one more distinction between, or rather a distinction between two, between another set of terms, Ruski and Russianian. It's also very closely and intimately related to the, to the definition of nation and patriotism. I think that in uh, the case of Glinka, even though the dialogue is given in translation. Um, the term is actually uh, Rossiyanian because, uh, uh, let me check, yeah, that's uh, 38, 38, because the um, uh, title as given in the original uh, Russian forum, and hence in my back translation, I, uh, sorry, I failed to consult, I, I, I had no time to consult, uh, the original piece. Why are you called the Russian? It must be. Please uh, correct me. Почему ты зовешься россиянином? Почему вы зоветесь россиянином? So something like that, but hardly Russian, Ruski. And uh, the watershed between the use of, Rus um, pre so to say, prevailing use of Russian and the prevailing use of uh, Ruski uh, more or less coincided. Co 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 coincided with 1812. And so that's a very meaningful, subtle, but yet meaningful distinction between Russianian connoting more state. So in your parlance, abstract state, uh, statehood, um, institutions, and Ruski as connoting more culture, uh, ethnicity, uh, language. After all, in Yevgeny Onegin, so we have both Russianian and Ruski. Татьяна русская душой сама не знаю почему с ее холодной красой любила русскую зиму. And лихая мода на наш тиран не дух новейших россиян. So, but that's so the so Pushkin's uh, Pushkin's uh, poem captures the very moment, the very over the very period of time when two terms uh, could be used interchangeably, but still uh, the, the trend was toward more and more for the wider uh, use of Ruski. And that's also, that's also, that speaks to the, uh, okay, to your point about, uh, as a, about patriotism and various meanings of patriotism. So that's, that's it. Uh, thank you, Mikhail, a lot. I'll start from the end. It is very interesting, Ruski and Russianian. I didn't think about it and I didn't see it um, in Scottish because I'm, I didn't come with totally new ideas in this chapter, maybe a little bit, but I mean, in general, I didn't see no one 
explains or works on this, but you're right. I mean, I know that there is different between Russian and they also heard this Rossi in- uh, Yeah, exactly, yeah. Rossi, and uh, which is very funny, um, but and actually Rossi usually used by, sorry, conservative more like Shashkov. He uses a lot of Rossi currency. Uh, but yeah, no, that's a, it's a very good point. I need uh, to check it myself. I just didn't see it much in my sources and also not in scholarship, but you're right. I mean, it's, 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 it's new, it's different and it should be connected somehow. Uh, I just need to figure out. Um, about uh, legal consciousness, uh, I think, yeah, I think I quoted that because, um, well, yeah, I mean, it, your bigger question is very interesting and important. Basically, um, who I call conservative or why I think they inferior or why it maybe comes in my work. I mean, I definitely need to paraphrase sentences if they bring this um, impression with the reader that I claim that conservative inferior because wasn't my intention, but I, yeah, but I quote this Wortman book because he actually talked there, which is, which is interesting, this book, not just about legal consciousness, but he talked there about personal attitudes uh, to Alexander and to Nicholas of Gludov, of uh, Dirjavin, mm -hmm. and, um, and I bring them because, uh, well, it's in my another chapter on honor when I talk about attitudes to monarch, uh, and so these people, like as I define conservative in a sense that they stay um, devoted or loyal to the monarch, right? So I guess that's, and that's why I kind of call maybe conservative patriotism when it's this kind of blind loyalty to the ruler and to the ruler's uh, decisions about oh, the state. And my way, just add one point just very briefly. That's exactly about blind loyalty. I forgot to mention a, a, a glaring example of Nikolai Mikhailovich Karamzin and his Zapiska Drevnia Novi Rossi. His loyalty to the monarch and specifically to Alexander the First was anything but blind uh, and uh, dog like, and just that, that he was conservative. And so his loyalty was pre pre predominantly and largely to the monarch, but still, so he speaks a very bold language. and. Okay, and he utters very bold things in that. Can I just add a two-finger point here? I mean, the scenario of Alexander the First friendship was indeed involved with his kitchen cabinet, but it was a scenario of the angel. And who was it who created that scenario? It was Karamzin with his ode, right, about an angel on the throne, which he wrote on the ascension of Alexander the First. And in that very ode, according to Wartman, right, he talks about uh, a citizen who is a hero. So to me, it's an ambiguous issue because on the one hand, the angel is semi-divine, right? It's not God or godly, but it is otherworldly and it is not secular at all. It is the elevation there is quite pronounced. And so I think that what is Stas is getting at maybe has to do with the element of a court of quasi-religious uh, devotion. My, and I think that I wanted to ask Stas actually, how, where is, does religion actually fit in here? Because if you're talking about love, which is your main emotion, right? And this gets back to um, Steve's question about the role of emotions. Really, you could use a little more about the nature of that love, right? Because there is a kind of religious love that could be uh, brought in um, or discussed uh, in relation to uh, religion. So I think Karamzin is, of course, seen as the founder of modern conservatism, right? So he both creates the angel scenario in a way, but he's also talking about citizen, uh, the, 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 the monarch as a citizen. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it's sort of right, and I write about it in another chapter, exactly that Alexander was an angel, so he was in between. He wasn't God but he still had to be somehow sacred. He needed sacrality, what he says. So he was angel, he was the first among the equal, in the, like he was a bit, a bit above, but he wasn't the gods. So already the mystification and the sacralization of monarchy already kind of wasn't um, on the way. It's one thing, 
Uh, but about uh, Mikhail, your question about uh, December's in conservative is a great one. I still don't have an answer. I think about it all the time because in a sense, what I'm trying through my whole dissertation, also this chapter to show that there was a continuity, right, between uh, Enlightenment and the older generations. And also on purpose bring different, uh, different nobles and different opinions from nobility, from bigger emotional culture to, to show, for example, that the Samuels were not, uh, they didn't have the only one who had this kind of, let's say, uh, liberal or progressive uh, patriot different kind of patriotism. Many other had, and the Java and Karamzin to a certain extent had something similar, right? So it is very hard indeed to define who was a Decembrist <laughs> in this era, and uh, modern scholars more and more say there were much more what is called Decembrists without December, that we usually think. A lot of uh, statesmen, generals, and uh, literati especially were kind of in the same um, state of mind or feeling, right, as, uh, as, uh, as the rebel. So it is hard here to, to make like distinctive lines. And I guess I have to be more careful about it. But then if eventually I have also to come, right, with something like, so why they were different? The service, what was radical? And this is the question that I'm still trying to answer um, to myself. Um, and about uh, religious love, yeah, I mean, um, Religiosity, it's a good question. Um, so Decembers were religious, but uh, it seems to me that it didn't play that big a role uh, for them. But obviously a lot in their attitudes were based on kind of previous kind of Christian mentality or Masonic spiritual um, traditions, but mostly, uh, when we read all the sources, they never, it never comes like forward. Very few, one or two persons. And uh, usually the, the language is exactly that, is Republican. Right? It's uh, about grajdanstvenost, about citizenship, about, so they kind of put the Slav, uh, uh, Walker wrote an article about this, actually about comparing two brothers, Glinka, Sergei, who was very more religious and Mason and Fyodor, and he says, yeah, I mean, it's there, the religion is there, the Masonic roots are there, but it's not the major point for them in some sense. Though Fedor Glinka was big mystic and very kind of spiritual. And uh, religiosity appears for December mostly during the trial. And in Siberia, they much more of them become much more kind of spiritual and religious, but the rhetoric is more, a secular French Revolution rhetoric, right, uh, during that period. So, but yes, I mean, religious aspect is that uh, it's true. Well, I was wondering if there's a distinction with the, what you're calling conservatives there, but I, I think that Catherine has been waiting for quite some time if she's still there. I still want to hear about what uh, Misha's question about teleology in his brilliant disquisition there about reading back. I think there's more to say there, but Catherine has been waiting so patiently. Uh, yeah, Catherine's kind of out of it. <laughs> the conversation has kind of gone in a different direction, but I'm going to forge ahead anyway. So um, uh, but just from this la last exchange, um, Alexander has Christ-like features occasionally. So it's a very fine borderline. I mean, he does resurrect drowning peasants and do things like in the in the popular historical literature. So that's just a little footnote. But um, and my question was something completely different. Um, I completely agree with Misha Dalbilov's comment. I'm always, at the very beginning, I'm always incredibly impressed, Stas, by your absolute mastery of this enormous literature, and especially the way you can uh, root it in the 18th century, and now even going back into the Muscovite period. Um, for some reason, this morning when I was reading this chapter, I found myself um, thinking about a much older historiography from the 50s and 60s here in the US. And the names are Chernyavsky, Raif, and Rezanovsky. So that kind of picks up that early theme about how does it connect with history of ideas and politics? Because I think you have a very 
besides the incredible detail, you have some very broad brush strokes here. I mean, these two shifts are so well argued and so well put, and you seem to have a really different conception of nation that then um, probably runs through most of the 19th century. I don't know, you don't go that far. But so what I wanted to ask you is, um, not necessarily their most well-known works, but Ryef's Origins of the Intelligentsia and um, Rezanovsky's Parting of the Ways. I mean, they situate that um, uh, disjuncture between the state and whoever people are at different moments. So I am just wondering, um, does the Tarasov interpretation fit anywhere on that spectrum from the late 18th century to the 1820s or 1840s even, um, or are they just already kind of old fashioned and not really relevant? I mean, th their names don't come up. Um, so I just wondered if you had a relation to their agenda. Uh, and then for Muscovy, um, also of course, Chernyavsky and the the Kantarovich and all that stuff, which um, might be nice just to stick in there a little bit. But um, so that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, I uh, three of the scholars that I, my favorite and Chernovsky, I have to read and I forget. I will definitely need it to the chapter on honor and Tsar. Um, I was thinking about uh, actually today, <laughs> accidentally on Rezanovsky, because I suddenly realized that what Wortman shows with Nicholas and later that didn't send there was no kind of part in the ways because the scenarios of power were greeted and accepted with um, with much uh, approbation by the elites and many historians say that this didn't change much um, but yeah but it is it's a good question I do think I personally do think there was part in the ways but parting the ways might have started earlier. And that, that's where Raif comes into. Actually, Raif is the most quoted scholar in my dissertation. <laughs> I read his thing that I think no one read. But uh, so it comes to this Raif theory of alienation. So it was uh, criticized a lot. And even in the latest books that I read, uh, he still criticized because people say, well, of course, uh, well, for those who don't know, I have said that the late 18th century, the 19th century, there was an alienation of Russian elites from service and from state service because of uh, bureaucracy, et cetera. And obviously most of the historians say, no, of course, uh, there was no alienation in this sense. Uh, nobles wanted to serve. My whole dissertation says exactly that. They want to serve and exactly this chapter on patriotism. And there was time, there were time where I thought the same, I was kind of angry at Rive. But then the interesting point that Rive uh, put some ideas, but just not in a final way, but especially when he writes about December, he makes the distinctions himself. He says, the alienation was not from state. Alienation was from state, but not from nation. Alienation was from the state grid, uh, from the state uh, itself, from state per se. But instead of it, liberal elites, and especially the sermon, they found the nation. So there was no total alienation that, in the sense that nobility just you know, put hands down and said, no, we are not going to serve. It was alienation exactly what Harkhorin basically says but there was a differentiation between ruler, state, and society. So society or nation, they, said they came forward. So in a sense, uh, uh, Rive's uh, thesis of the nation still stands true, I think, in this sense. But then if he's right, then indeed, uh, maybe we should uh, move this part in a way a little bit earlier. Um, I don't know, it's interesting. Okay, so um, the you floor is open. Go ahead, go ahead, please. Bye. Did you want to add something, Catherine? No, I just wanted to say that this was, uh, I appreciate this answer. Thank you. Um, I mean, the floor is open for more questions because we don't have a queue, but I, I wanted to pick up that. I mean, the point was that you're saying that it's the object of their service, right? It's not the monarch, it's the um, motherland, but then 
um, Raev's thesis is that that becomes, in his book on the origin of the intelligentsia, the service is ultimately transferred to the Narod by the mid 19th century. So there's a kind of trajectory there that in a way one wonders how you are, and, and several other people have alluded to this, what the sort of post history of this, if, if you're uncovering a kind of trajectory, right, with your theory of dual, what do you call it, disengage, I was gonna say dual polarization, dual disengagement of these concepts. But there's a kind of post history too, it'll be interesting for maybe in the conclusion or epilogue of your future book, um, but I, um, I, I, does anyone, I wanna open the floor to other questions for people who have not spoken. Okay, well, um, we are now uh, approaching the time. So I wanna give Stas your last word to kind of react to anything that's been said. I, I can see I have here a message. Uh, I related to the Colonel Tarasov on page 24. No, but I put SIG there, so you know, so I don't make a prank. <laughs> it's Colonel Tarasov. Um, yes, sources use concept of Rosiski, VVS Ruski. Yeah, I mean, um, it's a good question. It's once again reminds me of Mikhail Belbilov question about Rosiani that we need uh, uh, to do more. And there is an anthropology of emotional literature that you may, yes, anthropology of emotions. I'm familiar. That's it's huge literature. It's predated basically history of emotions. And most of what history of emotions says today has been already said in 70s and 80s by anthropology. Yeah, it's a different story. Okay, so um, anything else, Stas, in response to any of these issues? No. Okay, well, I think we've had a really I interesting- I wanted yeah. to thank everyone. Thank you very much uh, for your very important and thoughtful question. I have a lot to, to, to think over. Tom, please. Oh, yeah, it's a clap. I thought it was a hand, sorry. No problem. Well, I propose we uh, stick around for a few minutes to have a virtual reception with Stas. Maybe some anyone wants to stick around. Otherwise, um, we can stop recording. And uh, thanks very, very much. We'll all give Stas a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.